In uh, ship handling lesson 5, we covered ship handling situations to come starboard side alongside and also on berthing in various conditions. In this lesson, I will cover Scots at sea, bank effect and interaction. So let's get started. As we approach the shallows, water underneath the ship's hull tends to get squeezed. Since water cannot be compressed, its molecules accelerate. According to Bernoulli's theorem, acceleration in any medium results in a drop of internal pressure in that medium. In our case, acceleration of water molecules results in a drop of pressure underneath the hull of the ship. Since the weight of the ship is unchanged, ship has to displace more water to support her buoyancy, resulting in sinkage of the ship. The sinkage is also known as squat, which could be defined as apparent increase in her draft due to the shallow water effect. Since most ships are not box shape, therefore they not only sink but also trim either by bow or by stern. If a ship's center of buoyancy is forward of a midships, the hull is fuller in the bow than the stern. There is more immersed area forward than aft. Therefore, Scott will produce a head trimming moment. When the center of the buoyancy is aft of the midships, as is generally the case in finer line hulls, Scott causes a stern trimming moment. On our left is the water plane area of the sinkage due to squat suffered by a VLCC and on the right is the water plane area of the sinkage of a container ship. While comparing the two, you can see that ships with fat bows and finer sterns at summer draft will tend to trim by head while experiencing squat and these ship types are the large oil tankers, cape size bulk carriers, etc. And at the same time, the fine flared ships, such as container ships, passenger vessels, car carriers, and reefer ships, will tend to trim by stern. Bottom effects can be experienced in water depths up to 15 times the draft of the ship, but the effects will not be significant until we are in a depth less than two and a half times our draft. If a ship is experiencing squat, the wake will widen considerably and you may also notice hull vibration and forward facing bow waves that are also higher than normal. In shallow water, squat can be estimated by adding 10% to the draft or 0.3 meters for every 5 knots of speed. High speed in shallow water can also adversely affect a ship's ability to steer. Scott effect will vary from ship to ship. As the Scott is a direct result of a drop in pressure due to the water acceleration under the hull, Increased speeds result in increased water acceleration and increased sinkage. The most effective way to reduce squat is by reducing the acceleration of underkill water. And that can be achieved by reducing the speed of the ship. Squat also has an impact on the angle of your heel. A ship moving in shallow water with an angle of heel, will experience an increase in the list due to the squat, concentrating in the region of least underkill clearance. Similarly, an upright vessel will suffer squat-induced list if it moves 
over a shelving seabed that becomes progressively shallower under one side of the ship. Apparent increase in ship's list due to squats can be reduced also by reducing the ship's speed. Another impact of shallow water is its effect on ship steering. In shallower waters, the hydrodynamic forces on the hull actually act against the turning moment of the rudder. The directional stability of the ship, however, increases, and she may become almost impossible to steer by the rudder and may behave as running along tram tracks dictated by the seabed characteristics. The turning circle of most ships increases in shallow waters. Some ships may also have longer stopping distances in shallow waters. It is important that you check and consider your own ship's maneuvering characteristics data from the ship trials. You should also note that high or low frequency rudder cycling to reduce the ship's speed in an emergency may not yield the desired results as one may expect in deeper waters. Let's now have a look at the bank effect. In its most simplistic form, the hydrodynamic pressure distribution system around the forward moving ship can be seen as a boundary layer of water that surrounds a ship when it is making headway. Forward of the pivot point, a positive pressure area builds up. However, after the pivot point, the flow of water down the ship side creates a low pressure area. This area extends out from the ship and does not cause any concern in deep waters or when the ship is clear of any obstruction or traffic along her route. However, when the ship closes in on a bank, the pressure on the bow works on a short turning lever forward of the pivot point. But the low pressure or suction area on the other hand works well aft of the pivot point and is consequently a very strong force. Suction area further drops in pressure as the water gets squeezed and accelerates. As a result of the two forces, the stern of the ship is likely to be sucked into the bank. It can be very difficult to break out of this hold. The ship requiring constant corrective rudder action and power sometimes hard over even in order to control the heading. Bank effect increases with increase in speed. If speed is too high, bank effect can be severe and sudden and it can catch the ship handler unaware. You should slow down and steer towards the bank. By doing so, it may be possible to strike a balance with your ship running parallel to the bank. Bank effect is also felt on bends in a waterway when proximity to the outer bank may actually help the bow round a tight bend. Let's now have a look at the interaction between two vessels in a head-on passing situation. This situation can be split into four distinct phases. As a ship moves forward of the pivot point, a positive pressure area builds up. However, after the pivot point, a low pressure area builds up. So in phase one, as both ships approach on a head-on situation, positive pressure at the bow will cause them to repel each other. A helm order in the direction of passing, and in our case, a helm order to port side, is required to balance the interaction effect. A burst in the propeller wash may be briefly required to enhance the rudder thrust. In phase two, for a short interval,
pressure at the bows is balanced. You may apply midship's helm or even some starboard helm to neutralize suction if required. In phase 3, both vessels are drawn together by reduced pressure between their hulls. This may cause swing to port which should be controlled with starboard helm. In phase 4, as vessels clear each other, the sterns will be drawn together due to the negative pressure. Use the helm to control swing but keep vessels turning to starboard until they return to the course. Let's now look at interaction between two similar sized ships during overtaking. Unlike head-on, overtaking interaction can be quite dangerous as the maneuver is quite prolonged. We'll divide it into four phases. In phase one, the high pressure regions at the bow of overtaking ship B causes the ships to repel each other initially. So pressure built up at the bow of the overtaking vessel can cause the other vessel to turn across the bow if uncorrected. Vessel being overtaken, that is ship A, must take corrective action. In this case, port's helm to neutralize the swing. In phase 2, if both vessels use helm to maintain course, then as the bow of ship B overlaps the stern of ship A, the Bernoulli's effect between the two ships turns the high pressure into low pressure, drawing the bows of the ship B and stern of ship A closer. This is generally the most dangerous point in overtaking as there is both a turning movement and bodily suction drawing the ships closer to each other. In phase 3, mutual attraction of the ship sterns due to decreased pressure causes the overtaken vessel ship A to swing to port. Starboard helm is required to control the swing. In phase 4, ship A will observe suction of bow to starboard and this can be corrected by slight counter helm in ship A. Finally, let's look at interaction between a large and a small ship during overtaking. When two very dissimilar sized ships are passing in close proximity, the smaller vessel is affected by interaction considerably more than the larger one, as the pressure changes produced by flow around the larger hull are much greater than those of the smaller vessel. Tugboats are frequently in this situation when they work with larger ships. The tug is moving in water flow that is dominated by the pressure field surrounding the tanker for example in our case. Particularly if the larger vessel is moving in shallow water relative to its depth, this means that the water flow around the tug is not necessarily coming from right ahead, even if the tug moves ahead with the helm midships. If we divide this situation into different phases, in phase 1, the tug experiences flow coming on the outside bow which is pushing it in towards the tanker's aft quarter. In phase 2, the venturi effect develops between the tug's bow and the tanker's side. So the tug turns in towards the tanker and can be drawn bodily to its side. In phase 3, the tug is now in a region of the tanker's uniform pressure field. So the forces are due to the tug's own much smaller pressure distribution system. A small suction force accompanied by a weak turning out movement is created in the same way that the tug would react to the close proximity of a channel bank. In phase 4, the tug encounters increasing pressure at the bow as it moves past the tanker's forward shoulder whilst the venturi effect remains at the tug's stern. So these forces combine to suck the tug's stern in towards the tanker 
while swinging the bow outward. In phase 5, as the tug starts to clear the tanker's bow, water flow is still directed onto the inward side of its rudder and so causes an inward turning moment. If left uncorrected, tug may turn across the bow of the tanker and a relative speed with the tanker may significantly drop in a very brief interval. This may cause a collision, particularly when the positive pressure at the bow of the tanker is insignificant. As you have noticed in each of the five situations, a constant counter helm and increase and decrease of the tug speed is going to be required to ensure that at no point the tug comes too close to the tanker or gets sucked in. Alright guys, this brings us to the close of this lesson. I hope you enjoyed the session and I will see you soon.